uh, over to you uh, for your opening statements. You have five minutes. Okay, thank you. The last time I spoke in front of the Senate about MAID, the arguments I posed along with Dr. Nahid Donzani, Gabriel Peters, and many others were that disabled people who were suffering because of systemic failures due to systemic ableism would be negatively impacted by this expansion. People who were living in abject poverty or who were scared to enter our horrendous long-term care institutions or who were on wait lists for treatments or who couldn't see a reason for living because of a lack of accessible affordable housing would use this expanded MAID as their only option. I spoke about Chris Gladders the last time I was here, a man from Hamilton, Ontario, who used MAID because he was left sitting in his feces and urine for days at his long-term care home. Elected officials, you all gaslit us for months, stating that it was impossible for people to use MAID in these ways due to safeguards. You implied that the rights of people like Nicole Gladue, who testified that she wanted the choice to die with a champagne glass in her hand, was more important than the need to protect folks that I spoke about who were being systemically coerced into using MAID. Ms. Jamma, could you just slow it down? The interpreters are having, uh, have to translate it, yes. so just speak a little bit slower. Okay. Mr. President, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Since you interrupted the witness, would there would it be possible to turn the volume down a bit? Because it's impossible to hear the interpretation, because the the volume in this room is so high. Volume also because the translation is going into some people's ears and they're hearing your English, uh, because you're so close to them. So you can speak slower and uh, and perhaps lower the volume a little bit, and perhaps the technicians can lower the. Uh, well, if there's anything they can do, yeah. I'm a very loud person. I apologize. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> it's a loud subject. Okay. Um, can I start? Okay. You implied that the... Oh, well, I already read that part. <laughs> you implied that race and poverty had very little to do with the freedom and choice. Nicole Gladue has since died naturally not using MAID, yet her testimony allowed for the death of Sophia, who shared in death that the government sees me as expendable trash, a complainer, useless, and a pain in the ass, and the death of Denise, who explained that she applied for MAID essentially because of abject poverty. And these are two among many others who used it only because the government funded access to death over their ability to have food, shelter, and a sustained life. Due to your unwillingness to understand the, the adverse impacts of an expanded maid, more disabled people have already died who would have been alive since the last time I spoke to you. Across this country, social assistance rates further debilitate and harm disabled people by enforced poverty. Across this country, it can take years to access pain clinics, therapy specialists, primary care practitioners, palliative care, um, and, and palliative care is so chronically underfunded that it's considered a privilege. Across this country, disabled people are forced into long-term care facilities where the conditions are so egregious and fraught with instances of physical, emotional, sexual abuse, lack of nutritionist food options, proper hygiene practices, uh, so much so that we've normalized the death of 20,000 institutionalized disabled people from COVID-19. Across this country, there have been a reported 3.4 million COVID cases. We are seeing a mass debilitation of the most marginalized Canadians, responding only with greater access to death. The low estimate of, is 300,000 Canadians who are suffering from long COVID, who are now newcomers to the disabled community and raised by an ableist society. And what they are seeing as the response to their newfound impairments is the acceptance that to be disabled is a face, fate worse than death. That comes exactly from this committee. What, you have done to re what have you done to respond to the growing disabled population who don't have dementia? The population who aren't sure what this new life of de debility, of rampant ableism, and perhaps unemployment means to them. On the question of advanced directives, we must acknowledge that people can and will often change their minds, even after consenting to MAID. It is ableist to assume that people oh would 100% be unwilling to live in bodies that are deemed as less functioning. <sighs> True choice is the ability to change your mind. It is also worth noting that dementia is one disability that has been brought up often by this committee in this conversation of advanced directives, and this, di this disability impacts di black people disproportionately, yet this voice has been left out. On the question of mature minors, we must remember that mental illness and suicidality are, are at an all-time high for youth across Canada and disproportionately impacts disabled youth. It takes time to address, especially as a young person, to a disabled life and resources. Until we are sure, 
to have measures that prevent implicit coercion of youth due to pressures such as bullying, childhood poverty rates, and the lack of access to resources, I recommend that you limit any conversation of made from children, especially in relation to track two. Lastly, it's important to note that last week, the Canadian Human Rights Commission in response to reports that disabled people are in fact, like we said earlier last year, using MAID to escape systemic failures. They said May, uh, medical assistance in dying cannot be a default for Canada's failure to fulfill its human rights obligations. They said this because this is what you have allowed despite the warnings. How will you make amends for the lives that have been lost so far due to systemic coercion because of your decision to expand MAID specifically for the disabled community? The right of an individual's needs should not supersede the harms faced by others. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Jama. Um, that concludes the opening statements, and we'll now go to the question period, and I will hand it over to my co-chair, Senator Yona Martin. Thank you. Um, thank you to all the witnesses for your testimonies. So we'll begin uh, the first round with uh, five minutes of qu and question and answer for Mr. Barrett. Thank you, uh, Madam Co-Chair, and uh, thank you to the witnesses uh, for your testimony and uh, uh, giving us uh, of your time and experience this evening. Um, my, my first question uh, will be directed through uh, the Co-Chair uh, to um, you, Ms. Jama, and um, you talked about uh, having appeared before uh, at the committee, having uh, spoken personally, having spoken to senators and members. Uh, but do you feel that the uh, that the community, that disabled Canadians, have been adequately consulted about made legislation? Absolutely not. In this panel alone, four representatives, two today, are from Dying with Dignity. Uh, why am I the only representative from a disability-based org? Why is this the only day that we talk about disability rights when it impacts all of the sections that I have talked about? This shows that we are being left out in this committee and we have been left out systemically this entire time throughout this process. On top of that, the brief process of submitting only a thousand words leaves disabled people out who can't submit their thoughts like through written format or who don't have access to internet or who would prefer to communicate using video and we asked this committee in writing what we, what we could do to include other disabled people and we got no response. This committee has shown no desire to reach out to disabled people other than the people who are afraid of dying but not people who are living with disabilities and it's a shame and it's been like that this entire time. Uh, well, thank you, uh, thank you ma'am. Um, again, uh, I'd like to follow up on one of the comments that you made uh, in your uh, opening remarks and um, it had to do with uh, y you, you made the contention that the MAID framework is ableist in nature. And I'd, I'd like to ask you uh, why, and, uh, and, and perhaps you can expand on that for me, please. Yes, it's not, this is not a new sort of understanding that has come from disability community. Over 200 organizations this entire time spoke about the fact that this is ableist because we expanded made specifically to people who are living with disabilities who are seen as suffering. But many of us, we, we struggle day to day. It doesn't mean that my needs should be met simply by being offered death. I am terrified as someone with mental health disabilities and physical disabilities to enter a doctor and to be offered made as a form of treatment when I already deal with suicidality. Like, you're not listening to those who are already living with disabilities. You're predominantly hearing from people who are afraid to be disabled in the future, and those two things are not the same. Disabled people have already died because of those decisions, and we can't lose another single life for somebody that should have been fed or housed or offered therapy. It's not enough to say these things will come later because we already know 200 people who were not terminally ill have died and many of those people were people whose needs were not being met elsewhere. We can't allow other people to continue to die. Uh, thank you. Um, again, through the uh, co-chair to Ms. Jama, um, why do uh, issues of race and poverty matter in this conversation in your opinion? So like I mentioned earlier, you guys spend a lot of time talking about dementia, but dementia disproportionately impacts black and racialized people who are caregivers, who are staying at home um, and supporting families. And you've not heard from black um, people living in, in that uh, situation. Black people are less likely to send families into long-term care institutions because of how volatile they are and the mistreatment there and the racism there too. Um, in terms of in general with, with 
black people who are experiencing medical ableism and medical racism, you're already being worried about being coerced into your treatment plan. So for me, even the concept of rejecting surgeries was very difficult for me when I was a, when, when I was a young person. And so when you already feel like because of your race, you're being treated differently or you're being othered, and we already know that um, there's a lot of data that says that black people are mistreated or treated differently when you enter a hospital. You add that into the conversation around MAID, will black people be, you know, pushed into accessing made other like versus other treatments that should be available um i think yes and i don't think we've done enough research to be sure that black people won't be disproportionately affected and i know throughout covid uh black people have been predominantly affected and and have comorbidities and so we are not sure how this will impact the most marginalized in our communities and the voices that you have been listening to are predominantly white and that scares me um, and just a quick question. Uh, yeah, very know, quick, about 20 um, seconds. Just through you, uh, Madam Co-Chair, um, do you believe the same is true with respect to people being vulnerable to accessing MAID before having accessed other options is true as well for the disabled community, as you've said, for racialized or for uh, black Canadians? I also believe it to be the same for disabled people. I think that disabled people are often experiencing medical ableism. Um, We've had many people online talk about uh, doctors who don't listen to them, doctors who don't provide proper supports, um, and people who are afraid to enter long-term care systems um, on the basis of mistreatment in long-term care too, that's been documented. Thank you. And so many people are more vulnerable, to, if you're disabled particularly, to accessing MAID versus other treatments. Okay, thank you, Ms. Jama. Uh, next, we'll have uh, five minutes from Mr. Maloney. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. And I wanna thank all three witnesses not only for being here tonight, but for uh, displaying patience that you have. We're starting very late tonight. Uh, as Ms. Jama said, time is of the essence. Uh, we need to dedicate ourselves to the issue at hand. Sometimes that is delayed by procedural, I will use the word nonsense in the House of Commons, and tonight was an example of that, so you, you have my apologies on behalf of the committee. Um, my first question is to Mr. Adams. Uh, thank you, sir, for being here tonight. Uh, you indicated that you had applied for MAID and that you'd been approved. Is that correct, sir? That is correct. Did you apply for uh, MAID after Bill C-14 was passed, or did you apply only after C-7 came into force? I had initially applied um, when C-14 had passed, or uh, yes. Okay, thank you. So. Look, Lived experience is important for all of us on this committee for the reasons we've heard. So I'm, I'm wondering if you would be willing to sort of take us through the process that you went through after C-14 and after C-7 so we have a better understanding of how it works. And if you could, was it the same group of medical uh, practitioners that you were dealing with on both occasions? Yeah, well, okay, so the first uh, time that I I tried to apply for MAID. Uh, the, the process was shut down fairly quickly. Be initially, I had uh, been considering applying under the sort of interim court ruling that was there before the actual C-14 bill was um, passed. Um, and as soon as it became clear that C-14 was going to limit eligibility, uh, I was basically told, you know, it's just not going to go forward. And I sort of um, stopped trying after that for a while. Um, C7 then passed and uh, I uh, reached out to my local health authority and uh, through that coordination center, I was able to be put in touch with a, a doctor and uh, went through the, the 90 days. So, you know, that was quite a, a lengthy um, uh, assessment and the uh, consultation with the uh, third party the or the, uh, the specialist um, was very very thorough um, and I had done more tests than I have ever done before uh, and this was a specialist that has dealt with me for a number of years so knows me knows my condition knows what I've tried um, and uh, so you know I went through all, all of the other uh, measures in the law and was found eligible and uh, I waited some time and then I eventually got a second approval as well 
Um, one of the doctors was uh, part of my initial uh, exploration uh, of C14, and clearly had two different uh, interpret or two different um, conclusions with these two different bills. Thank you. But those those were based on the law. Those were legal conclusions, not medical conclusions. I'm assuming. Um, by the test under the legal the criteria under the first legislation. Essentially, yes, I would say so because the uh, full um, assessment didn't really happen on the first one. It was kind of just a meet and greet, and yes. Thank you. So, do you feel you had uh, a full hearing, if I can put it that way, and you had ample opportunity to discuss all of the implications, ramifications with your doctor and everybody who was involved in the decision making process? Yes, I do. Of exclusion. What can you put put a little bit uh, more detail into that for me? What time frame would you be looking at? Um, how would that work exactly? Well, um, I think that it could be uh, basically a form that a person brings to their doctor or to their health authority, and uh, you know chooses a set number of years. Uh, I suppose you could put a cap on it if you wanted to, um, maybe five years uh, or so, or up to a decade, uh, depending on the needs of the individual and their level of comfort with MAID. Thank you. I've only got a few seconds left, so I'm going to turn to uh, Mr. LeBlanc. You said you had some ideas on safeguards. We don't have time for you to uh, set them out tonight, but would you be good enough, sir, to send us some information in writing if that's possible? Your microphone, Sorry. Mr. LeBlanc. Would be my pleasure, but that would be very short because I do believe that you don't need extra safeguards for people who are physically disabled for name or made uh, to believe that those people need extra safeguards means that. Uh, because they are physically disabled, they are all the way also, by definition, and you know, automatically, uh, intellectually uh, disabled as well. Otherwise, you know, that means that you believe that they, they, they're not in a position because they have a physical impairment of some kind they are not able to make decisions by they, themselves or for themselves. Merci, Mr. Leblanc. Thank you, Mr. Leblanc. Uh, Mr. Terriot. Now we have Mr. Terriot for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. If I understand correctly, in order to continue the conversation with Mr. Leblanc, if I understand you correctly, what you find discriminatory is if in the end we don't allow you to have access to MAID, as you said earlier, that uh, you had worked hard so that in Quebec we'd be able to set up the uh, law on end-of-life care, and I understand you, I think. Yes, quite well. It's that As I said, it would be very discriminatory if a person meets all of the criteria that are set out by the um, Supreme Court in Carter. I don't see why, uh, if you have a, an, a missing arm or, or some other disability, would have anything to do with the decision-making process. It would be altogether discriminatory. And why would we treat those people's applications? It, it would be discriminatory because you add yet another obstacle for those people to the use of their right 
to ask for medical assistance in dying. Why would these people who already have many problems in life would be limited to different, more severe requirements than someone who's asking for medical assistance in dying because they're dying of a cancer? It's totally discriminatory. These people don't need to be protected. They're able to defend themselves. And if we respect their rights as human beings, and if we respect their rights, they will be able to protect themselves. They don't need to uh, have someone come and, and treat them like children or use them as game pieces on, uh, in another agenda. If their rights are respected, people who have physical disabilities are able to take decisions themselves and for themselves. Given that if the disability is individual and is unique to that person, it, there's always a social aspect to it, and indeed, we have to do not create further ha handicaps for that person. You, you said that there are p these people are able to think for themselves. There's an old philosopher who wrote a book uh, in old age, Paul Ricard. He said his name was, and he said that autonomy isn't doesn't isn't reduced to physical autonomy or social autonomy the full sense of uh, the word autonomy is a moral autonomy that is to say the ability to make a practical judgment for oneself and to take clear and make clear and enlightened decisions for oneself and i imagine that you would agree with Ricard on that absolutely that is the very essence of being a human being. That is the very essence of humanity, to be able to exercise that independence. In the respect of society, but there is no greater demonstration of what it is to be a human being than to f fully assume your autonomy and independence. So, as, so in life and in terms of death as well. You said that you've been in a wheelchair for 20 years and I imagine that uh, you uh, haven't reached the point that you wanted to exercise your right to have medical assistance in dying, but I imagine that it must have been some comfort to you that uh, before you get to that level of intolerableness that it is possible for you to do so. Yes, and that is why I worked so hard at the provincial level uh, to this end. I think that no one wishes to have to turn to medical assistance in dying. And I think we are all afraid of dying. But uh, what gives us the most fear is how we're going to die. Is it going to be some kind of agony that we'll have to face? And the fact of having a choice, it's not an obligation. You, you, it's one choice amongst others made. Each person makes uh, their own decision in light of their own situation and convictions and beliefs. So for me, indeed, it is a great relief, uh, and it uh, is for my family as well. I've been in a wheelchair for 20 years. For 20 years, my family has been taking care of me as a person in a wheelchair. And the perspective, if I ever am to reach that point, I'm th thank you, Mr. LeBlanc. To turn to maid, it is a great comfort for me and for my loved ones. Thank you, Mr. LeBlanc. Uh, Mr. McGregor.
Madam Co-Chair? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Jama, I think I'll, I'll uh, start with you. Um, as you know, like our committee was given a fairly broad mandate from the House to cover five areas. Uh, only one of these is actually going to turn into law. Um, we're we're kind of studying the issue, knowing that in March of next year, mental illness is under an under, underlying condition uh, will come into effect um, in, in 2023. But the others are, are fairly broad. And, you know, when this committee got underway in April um, and, and we had our first couple of meetings, it felt right away that, that we were doing a fairly rushed job. You know, the House initially gave us a deadline of June the 23rd, and I think it very quickly dawned upon members of this committee that that, that was just going to be an impossible task. And we've now extended it to, to October 17th, but, you know, your testimony today and, and our earlier conversation, I remember that you were talking to me about the idea of pausing or slowing down. Um, I guess what I'd like you to tell us as a committee is, um, you know, can you expand on that a little bit more, why we should pause or slow down this conversation, and could you suggest ways uh, in which this committee could further engage with various members of the disability community um, over the remainder of the spring, the summer, and the fall, uh, just so we have a, as broad a cross-section of voices as possible? Yeah, a lot of us don't have the resources that the Dying with Dignity Lobby funded by Margaret Atwood and larger names, has. So by the time I learned, and many of us learned, about the expansion of Bill C-7, we didn't make it to the third reading. It was an unprecedented 18 months. That's how long it took you all to make the decision to expand made. And I have named the names of people who died, not because they wanted to end their lives, but because they had no other options around food and shelter and housing. I understand that the previous speaker did say that none of us want to use MAID and everybody's afraid to die, but there have already been lives lost on top of the fact that we know it's been documented and talked about by the Ontario Human Rights Commission that MAID was being offered in jails in place of probation. We have an obligation, a moral obligation to stop rather than reviewing the harms that have been caused. This committee has spent more time talking about potential expansions. You should have been using this time to look back and to look at the mistakes and to look at what the rush has caused, especially in light of COVID, especially in light of the despair that a lot of disabled people are feeling around what it means to live as a disabled person right now, where we know that doorknobs were being removed from long-term care homes, where many people couldn't afford to eat. I have met disabled people living in tents who were housed, who were talking about using MAID, in tents outside, in wheelchairs. Like, this isn't okay, and it's not enough for those of us who want to feel some semblance of comfort to, to be making decisions for the rest of the people who are not in the room. Because guess what? Nicole Gladue died naturally after setting the way for people to use MAID for no other option. This committee has an obligation to slow down and to talk to more people, to talk to houseless people, to talk to racialized people, to talk to young people and youth, and not succumb to the force that is the Dying with Dignity lobby, because it's not fair for the rest of us. Um, one thing I want to uh, expand upon is um, just on, like there, in the minister's mandate letter, she's been tasked with a review of access to federal disability programs in the previous parliament, the government introduced, uh, I think it was Bill C-35, which was going to set up a federal disability benefit. It was set up on, it was introduced on June 21st. They knew a, a, an unnecessary election was coming, so I, I think that uh, that was introduced for show. Uh, we are well into the 44th parliament. We still have no uh, sight of, of a federal disability benefit bill coming forward. Uh, in the in the 45 seconds I have, could you maybe just expand on like what the landscape is out there and, and when we look at federal disability supports, what does the Parliament of Canada really have to tackle to address that issue? Because I think that's a big part of this conversation. Disabled people should not be legislated into poverty in every single province, and that's what's happening. People can't afford to eat or pay rent. There's also our health care issues. Why does it take t up to two years to access a pain clinic in Ontario? Why are there so many wait lists? You're making it impossible for us to choose to live. 
And as, especially those of us who are aging into our disability, it's getting harder and harder, not because we can't do it ourselves, but because there's no resources available and not enough funding in our healthcare systems. And we can't simply afford it. And so as much as we're talking about the federal disability benefit, we also need to be talking about our healthcare systems and the failures there too. And this committee has an obligation to look into that because it's all connected. If you're gonna allow people to kill themselves, look into why they're doing that and look into our healthcare systems. Thank you. And I'll turn this over to uh, Mr. Garneau for questions from the senators. Thank you, co-chair. And we'll start with the senators with three-minute rounds. And uh, we'll begin with the senator Meji. You have three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question is for Ms. Jama. I have the impression of having understood that when people are in a situation of poverty and they're poorly housed, that's the first thing that's going to be proposed to them is made. And, and in fact, there must be some care. It's the person who should decide. Uh, this should never be imposed on, uh, on anyone. Have you heard stories that would say that some people had made imposed on them? There's been stories in the media uh, like there were two cases, I, I talked about them in my testimony. One of them was a woman named Denise who, she was looking for affordable housing. Her friends were, were fundraising for her and it still wasn't enough. Her only other option, um, because where she was living was causing her disability to flare up so badly and she also couldn't afford to eat food. Her only other option was to use MAID. And when I talk about systemic coercion, I'm not saying somebody's hold, holding a gun to your head. I'm saying that the systems are working together to provide no other options for people to choose life and that we're allowing that to happen as elected officials. And it is still coercion, whether or not someone explicitly told you to do it. If, if we are voting on situations that don't allow housing supports, but allow death as an option first. Because as you heard, other people with disabilities who found their pain intolerable, they're comfortable with the idea that when they need this, they will apply for it. So I don't have the sense that they're under pressure. I mean, they're saying if that when if there's no more medicine that they can give me to alleviate that, I might ask for MAID. So I'm having a bit of trouble following it. But perhaps that if we're poorly housed, then that's, uh, that's not the same thing. What do you think? When you have lived without, it's not hard to imagine that people wouldn't want to. It's getting harder and harder to live. Like these cases were all over the Toronto Star of people saying, I've tried really hard to survive but made is my only way out and I wish it wasn't. I wish I had housing because I would have stayed on this earth. And so that's a coerced choice. It's a choice made because there was no other option available. So it's not really a choice. And we've seen that in this country where like forced sterilization was a thing against disabled people, institutionalization, the idea that many of us don't want to send our family to long-term care homes, but it's our only option because we can't afford anything else. All these things are examples of coercion. And so, while it may be hard for specific committee members to imagine why, why someone would make that choice, it's because maybe you've not been without food or shelter or housing or had to live in these situations. I have, so I've come all the way here to tell you that it's true. Thank you. Uh, Senator Kutcher. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, two questions, the first one to uh, Ms. Jama. Um, in made assessment, uh, the assessors, uh, as we heard already, pay very careful attention to treatments that people have had and uh, treatments that uh, are suggested as possible. Uh, now, there, there have m many uh, providers have suggested that this kind of assessment should also include addressing structural inequalities. For example, the need for housing. Uh, income assistance, and that those should be integrated into every single MAID assessment so that they don't coerce people where they shouldn't be coerced. 
What would you think about, uh, would you suggest or consider that that thing should be essentially a part of any med made assessment to make sure that people aren't being coerced? Absolutely. And at the same time, I think about the case in BC where a woman access made under the 90 days and it's being investigated by the RCMP. Right, and she was given made, and she didn't access treatment for her disability, her mental health disabilities, and and that's being investigated. And so while we can keep saying we're going to add safeguards, if we lose one life, that's enough for us to pause and evaluate why that happened. And as somebody with mental health issues myself, I have been in treatments over and over again. It's difficult to sustain it when you're also trying to continue to live, right? And sometimes I get so overwhelmed. And I'm like, I don't want to be here. But that changes maybe after the 90-day period. And it's hard. But I just mean that we need to have more options available. Because it took me a year to get into, into proper therapy. And even then, I could have decided to do something else. And so it's like, one, we're losing people because they're... they're for someone okay. else. Okay. So, but I think you answered that question okay. very well. Thank you so much. I, I, I have... Uh, a question for our, our, our first uh, witness, um, Mr. Adams. Mr. Adams. Um, you talked about uh, uh, you've done a made assessment, but you have not yet chosen to to um, move towards made. Uh, and you said something that I wasn't, I didn't quite catch. Something about reduced stress and improved state of mind. Uh, did, did you mean that you were getting actually relief from intolerable suffering uh, by simply having gone through that process and having that option? I, I couldn't quite understand that. Yes, I'm trying to explain that the knowledge that I am assessed and approved has changed the way that I experience my condition psychologically. Like, I, I feel... Um, just intense relief. And uh, as a result, it gives me more strength to endure my episodes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Delfon. Senator Delfon. A list, I think this is very important and their testimonies are very important. Uh, my, my question is for Monsieur. My question is for Mr. LeBlanc. You heard the dilemma is just that uh, some groups can be systemically disadvantaged, and it means that the options are less interesting than those that perhaps you uh, were, had. You were, you were an educated man. You were a deputy minister in Ottawa and in Quebec City. What do you say to people? that all persons with disabilities should not have access to MAID in order to protect those who can't provide consent that seems as valid as yours. I understand the connection you can make between being disabled and having the uh, physically disabled and versus being disabled intellectually. It's the same thing as saying when we were having the debates as to whether or not women were intelligent enough to vote because they were women. It's the same kind of argument here in 2022 on the fact that someone who has physical difficulties would not be able to make decisions for themselves. Clearly, we have enormous problems. There are social, economic, socioeconomic problems and also problems with the health care system. MAID cannot cover all of these difficulties. It, 
it's it's not a magic bullet. It's not a panacea. It's not a generic remedy. And I understand that people would have a great deal of difficulty. But it should not prevent those who meet the criteria as set out by the Supreme Court to be able to turn to that remedy. Thank you. Merci, Senator. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, uh, Co-Chair. I think many people seeking MAID are less able than they once were. Some may be disabled or have become uh, disabled. Some may be contemplating suicide because reluctantly because they don't have the option of MAID, but I think we have to be very careful in our discussions here um, that we do some fact-checking. I think it's risky that we accuse MAID providers, uh, licensed medical professionals in this country, of coercing people into um, MAID, of imposing MAID on people, of making offers of MAID in exchange for for freedom, this is a. These are very. These are matters of law. The courts have ruled on this, and the governments have responded by writing very, very carefully crafted legislation. So, uh, I, I want us to be um, very cautious in that. I want to go to Mr. Adams, if I could, because you have been through that process both um, attempting to do so under C-14 and then again under C-7. You said that you thought it was, uh, it was a, an intense process. Give us a couple of examples. Do you think you could have walked in and said, I have uh, nowhere to live uh, or I'm, I'm part of a minority group, uh, please give me MAID, and they would have responded? Uh, I certainly wouldn't think to to say those words. I think that would be um, totally divorced from my reasoning for going forward with made or uh, uh, going forward with the assessment for made. Um, and I am an indigenous person, and so uh, you know some of the conversations tonight at this meeting I feel were kind of uh, talking about me without me, um, and I find that. Uh, a little bit frustrating. Uh, so to get back to your uh, question, no, I, I definitely not. It was a, it was a very. I found it very personal, uh, in a sense, in that I felt that was really sharing things with uh, the assessor that perhaps I hadn't told anyone before. Things like indignities uh, that had occurred um, as a result of my symptoms that I haven't haven't even told my parents. You know. These are these are very sensitive conversations that I had, and I felt heard for the first time, uh, probably in my life. I felt that I was seen, and I I I I can't really give you, in proper words, you know, the, the gravity of of what I experienced in that in that assessment. What it meant for me was enormous, and I, you know, I I I'm sorry to to. Uh, emote here but it's hard not to it's profound I, I you know that's, that's all I could say but that experience was thorough you couldn't have walked in and said look I'm having a bad day um, it was extremely thorough yes okay I'm going to leave it at that thank you thank you senator senator martin um, and thank you to all of the witnesses for your very compelling testimonies. Um, I have two questions for Ms. Jama. The first one, uh, Dr. Heidi Jens has written about Canada's MAID regime saying, when a government starts making laws based on the premise that some lives are not worth living, it is setting out an extremely dangerous path. Ms. Jama, do you believe that the current MAID framework uh, communicates to people with disabilities that their lives are less valuable than able-bodied Canadians? Yes, I have maintained, like many other disabled people throughout this entire conversation, that I am pro-choice in life and in death. But when you do have a situation where it's been documented that disabled people are choosing to use MAID, um, 
because they have no other options available. And again, I talked about Chris Gladders, who was sitting in his feces and urine for days and then chose to use MAID because of an understaffed, undercared for a long-term care situation. He didn't have another option. And so yes, this, this idea that we're gonna allow only disabled people and not the rest of the population to use MAID as a way out because of other conditions that they can't control, I want everybody to have the comfort of using MAID when they want to. But I'm also thinking about all the people who have died and it's been documented, it's in the news, so I think you all should look it up. It's like in the Toronto Star in the last couple of weeks. Um, uh, like, I want these people to have their choice, but I don't want more people to die if their needs could have been taken care of elsewhere. My comfort like, in having made as an option is not more important than someone else's life. What can be done to improve the MAID regime to protect Canadians with disabilities from premature deaths? So what recommendations do you have? Like I said earlier, I recommend that this committee move slowly. We're moving really quickly to talk about further potential expansions versus looking back on all the missteps and all the potential cases that I'm talking about that you guys seem to not know about, where people have died when they shouldn't have, where in our jail systems there were situations where also like MAID was being offered in place of parole, like to the point where the Canadian uh, Human Rights Commission last week put out a statement against this. So what I'm saying is we need to slow down and my recommendation is that we take our time and take this seriously. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, to all of the witnesses, uh, a very big thank you for coming on this evening. First of all, putting up with a large delay, but secondly, for your powerful testimonies. Uh, uh, I just want you to know also that this is the first session on the theme of disability, but we will be talking about this subject uh, as we go forward. There are other sessions planned. Thank you very much again for your presence this evening. Um, with that, we will suspend momentarily and uh, to get ready for the second panel. Thank you.